Hello and welcome to the Daily News Simplified, an answer to what, why and how of newspaper reading. Today we are going to analyze the important news appearing in the Delhi edition of the Hindu newspaper dated 24th December 2019. The topics to be discussed today are reflected on your screen and the timestamping for the same has been provided in the description box below. So let's start. Now this news has been taken from page number 9 and it is talking that DRDO recently has successfully test fired the quick reaction surface to air missile. Hence in a discussion we will be talking about QRSAM, we will be talking about its capability and how it is of significance to India's air defense system. Now this discussion is important from the perspective of science and technology, more so from the prelims, however it can be used while writing a mains answer on India's air defense system. Now let us start by first understanding certain basics about the QR-SAM. Now the quick reaction surface to air missile has been developed by the DRDO in collaboration with Bharat Electricals Limited and Bharat Dynamics Limited. As a part of India's air defense system, the QR-SAM is capable of striking targets on the move and it has a strike range of 3 to 30 kilometers in less than a minute and can strike targets at various altitudes from 30 to 60 kilometers. Further, the QR-SAM has a speed of 700 to 800 meters per second. Now the QR-SAM uses RF frequency seeker or the radio frequency seeker as part of its terminal guidance to hit the target. Now the QR-SAM is propelled by solid fuel and it has a truck mounted canister. Further, the QR-SAM can operate in all weathers and in all terrain and also has a 360 degree rotatable launch unit. That is to say, it can fire in any direction 360 degree. Additionally, the QR-SAM has both surveillance radar as well as fire control radar. And what is interesting is that the QR-SAM is also equipped with various electronic countermeasures which can be used against the aircraft jammers to deceive enemy radars. Now coming on to what is the significance or the capabilities of the QR-SAM. Now QR-SAM are most effective in combating low flying aerial targets. And these include various forward tactical battlefield area formations like attack helicopters, unmanned aerial vehicles, armed drones, subsonic cruise missiles, etc. Furthermore, QR-SAM is very capable of urban as well as a close range combat because it is lightweight has a quick reaction time and also has a higher mobility, especially when we compare it with the Akash. Now QR-SAM is very significant for India because it is capable of being deployed both as the first line or the last line of defense. In the first line of defense, due to its high mobility and short reaction time, it can be deployed on the forward tactical battlefield area formation when army is on the move. And as a last line of defense, due to its multiple target capability, it can be deployed to safeguard military assets. Additionally, if we compare it with Akash, Akash is more effective against high flying targets like fighter aircrafts because it has high altitude range. Furthermore, since Akash has a higher warhead payload capacity, Akash can be used for static military asset targets. So though QR-SAM has its own advantage, but as far as high flying targets are concerned and targeting static military asset is concerned, Akash would be a better option. Now it is but obvious that a large country like India needs multi-layered air defense cover. Now to tackle multiple level air threats, there are four categories of air defense systems. These are namely quick reaction surface to area missile, short range surface to area missile, medium range surface to area missile as well as long range surface to area missile. As an additional information, you should also know that India has also acquired QR-SAM Spider from Israel for the Indian Air Force. A few other details about the QR-SAM has been provided for in the PDF. You can go through that. Now, there is a little correction. As far as the altitude range of the QR-SAM is concerned, it is 30 meter to 6 kilometers and not 30 kilometers to 60 kilometers. So kindly please make a note of this. So this is all about the QR-SAM. Let's move on to our next news. This news appears on page number 9 and it is titled South has higher prevalence of mental disorder study. Now this discussion of ours will become important from the perspective of social issues, especially that related to health under GS paper 2. Now recently, the first comprehensive estimate of disease burden attributable to mental health was released. Now this estimate was prepared 
by India State Level Disease Burden Initiative and was published in the journal Lancet Psychiatry. Now this was basically a state-wise analysis wherein the states in India were divided into three categories based on the socio-demographic index. Now the socio-demographic index is basically a composite measure of per capita income, mean education as well as the fertility rate in women under the age of 25 years. So please remember this fact that the socio-demographic index is measured on these three parameters of per capita income, mean education as well as fertility rate in women under the, years, under the age of 25 years. Now as far as the finding of the study is concerned, the study shows that one in every seven Indian suffers from some kind of mental disorder, main of them being depression, anxiety, bipolar disorder, autism, conduct disorder, conduct disorder, schizophrenia, etc. Secondly, the contribution of mental disorders to the disability adjusted life year has doubled from 1919 to 2017. That is, it has gone up from 2.5% in 1990 to 4.7% in 2017. Now the disability adjusted life year is basically the sum total of, of all the years of life lost and lived with disability. To give an example, let's say the average life expectancy of a person was 70 years. However, when the person was of 40 years age, he got cancer. Now due to cancer, the person suffered for let's say 3 to 4 years and then finally passed away. Hence the dally would be the 3-4 years he suffered plus 70 minus 43 years, that is 27 years of life which that person lost. Hence, disability adjusted life years is nothing but the amount of years lost and lived with disability by a person. Coming back to the finding of the study, this study found out that out of all the mental disorders, majority of the people suffered from depression and anxiety. As far as depression is concerned, the state with the highest depression was Tamil Nadu, followed by Kerala, Goa and Telangana. And for anxiety, it was Kerala, Himachal Pradesh, Tamil Nadu and Karnataka. Hence, the overall conclusion we can draw is that the southern states have higher prevalence of mental disorders as compared to northern states because it is states like Tamil Nadu, Kerala, Telangana, Karnataka and Andhra Pradesh which account for a higher prevalence of mental disorders that manifest primarily during adulthood in depression and anxiety. So this was all about this news. Let's take up our next article. This next news is taken from page number 12. And it is stating that Russia is hopeful that India will sign a free trade pact with EAEU, that is the Eurasian Economic Union. Now this discussion of ours is important both from the perspective of economics as well as international relations. Now as stated, Russia is hopeful that India and Eurasian Economic Union will sign a free trade agreement which will help to strengthen the economic cooperation between India and Russia. Hence, in this regard, let us know a few details about the Eurasian Economic Union. Now, the Eurasian Economic Union was established in the year 2014 and currently it has five members, namely Russia, Belarus, Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan and Armenia. Now, the Eurasian Economic Unit provides for the free movement of goods and service, capital and labour and also speaks about a coordinated, harmonised and single policy in all those sectors which are determined by the member countries. Now the EAEU is seen as an attempt by Russia to consolidate its hegemony over the erstwhile Soviet countries. Furthermore, it is also seen as a countermeasure by Russia against its isolation by USA and European Union. So from the perspective of prelims, please remember the names of the five member countries and from the main perspective, Please keep in mind what this Eurasian Economic Union means for Russia. Let us now talk about what will be the benefits for India if it signs a free trade agreement with Eurasian Economic Union. The foremost of them is that it will boost trade and investment with the Eurasian Economic Union from the current $9 billion to almost $37 to $62 billion. Second is that it will help India to integrate with global value chains. Now, as you must be knowing, India has decided not to become part of the RCEP. Therefore, there is a need for India to explore other FTA options in order to get integrated into the global value chain. And hence, the FTA with the Eurasian Economic Union can provide this similar opportunity. Third, 
It will boost exports of India, especially in the sectors of pharmaceutical drugs, textile, services, etc. Because an FTA with the EAEU will enable India to leverage its strength in exports. Fourthly, it will help India to counter the Chinese influence in Central Asia. Now, India's trade volume with Central Asia is as low as $1 billion, whereas China, due to its physical proximity with Central Asia, as well as its good and robust transportation link, has almost a $50 billion trade volume with Central Asia. Now, the signing of the FTA, as well as the establishment of the International North-South Transport Corridor, will enable India to counter the growing Chinese influence in Central Asia and trade in larger volumes with Central Asia. Fifth and the last is the energy security. As you must be knowing, Russia and Central Asian countries are very rich in energy resources such as petroleum, natural gas, etc. Hence, the signing of the FTA will also help India to diversify its energy sources, thereby securing its energy requirements. Last, let us see how India can better utilize this FTA with the Eurasian Economic Union. Firstly, since India does not have physical proximity and transportation link with Central Asia, it needs to take care of trade logistics by urgently completing the International North-South Transport Corridor. Secondly, India and the EAEU should provide long-term multiple entry visas for the benefit of the businessmen in order to promote investment. Third, since India and Central Asia have a language barrier, to counter this language barrier, there should be initiatives to exchange art and culture and even student exchange programs between the region can be enhanced and encouraged. So this was all about this article. Let's take up our next news. Now this news has been taken from page number 11 and it is titled A Decision Without Forethought. Now basically in this article, the author is analyzing the impact of Citizenship Amendment Act on the Northeastern region and in turn, the importance Northeastern region holds in India's foreign policy. So therefore, the points which we will be discussing in this article can be used both to answer the question, what will be the impact of the Citizenship Amendment Act on India's foreign policy, as well as importance of the Northeast region on India's foreign policy. This discussion of ours will become important from the perspective of international relations. Now, the Northeastern region links India with the ASEAN nation. Hence, it is a gateway to Southeast Asian economies. But because of the turmoil being caused by the Citizenship Amendment Act, various projects in the Northeast, like the Asian Trilateral Highway, the BBIN Corridor, the Kaladam Multimodal Project, etc., will be affected due to the tension and the chaos in the Northeastern region. Now, in this article, the author in particular has spoken about the India Japan relationship and how they are also likely to get affected because of the Citizenship Amendment Act. Now, in the year 2017, India and Japan established the Act East Forum. Now, this forum was expected to drive ahead India and Japan's cooperation in the Northeast region. Now, Japan too, as part of its free and open Indo-Pacific strategy, has been investing in the Northeast. A few examples of this are, that firstly, Japan has decided to invest 13,000 crores in different projects in the northeastern region. The GICA, that is the Japan International Cooperation Agency, is helping to build northeastern road and network connectivity, water supply projects, as well as the economic modernization of the entire northeastern region. Furthermore, India's longest bridge between Dhubri in Assam and Fulbari in Meghalaya is also being financed by Japan. Additionally, for the development of Northeastern Road Network Connectivity Improved Project, Japan has contributed substantial official development loan. Next, India and Japan also have decided to launch the Japan-India Northeast Bamboo Initiative, keeping in mind the fact that bamboo plays a very important role in the Northeastern region. And under the Japan-India Northeastern Bamboo Initiative, Industrial uses of bamboo and forest management will be promoted and encouraged. Additionally, to bolster India-Japan cooperation, the Japanese language is also being promoted in the northeastern areas. Next, under the Asia Health and Wellbeing Initiative, Japan has decided to pursue a skill development project for the caregivers in the northeastern region. 
last but not the least a lot of private japanese organization are also financing a lot of development projects in the northeastern region however having mentioned all these instances of india japan cooperation in the northeast the author is of the view that due to the citizenship amendment act japan may have to rethink on a lot of these development projects and this in turn might affect japan's engagement projects in pursuing the rest of the country as well now apart from proving to be a setback to the collaborative efforts between india and japan the citizenship amendment act poses certain other threat as well now the author is of the opinion that already the situation in kashmir is quite volatile after the abrogation of article 370 hence the author feels that the government's decision to implement the citizenship amendment act is not a very smart one because in doing so the government has opened another frontier of vulnerability in the northeast further the author says that the united nations has described the citizenship amendment act as fundamentally discriminatory thus it does not pose a good image for india on the international front fifthly amidst all this chaos in india various countries like us uk and canada have issued travel advisories to their citizens visiting the northeastern region last but not the least india has been described as the internet shutdown capital of the world furthermore India's stand on the human right has also taken a beating. Hence, all in all, it can be said that the Citizenship Amendment Act will not only have an adverse effect on India's domestic affairs, but will also pose a lot of important foreign policy concerns. And considering the fact that on the global level, India has always been respected and admired for its diversity and inclusive character. Therefore, it's very important that this image of India as a tolerant and inclusive country. has to be preserved and cultivated further so these were some of the main points of this article now let's take up our next news now this news has been taken from page number 14 and it reads beijing attacks washington for weaponization of outer space now recently china has warned that united states of america was turning the cosmos into a battlefield after washington announced a new military arm called the space force Now this discussion of ours is relevant from the perspective of science and technology as well as from the perspective of international relations. Now basically following the concerns that China and Russia are trying to challenge United States of America's position in the outer space, President Donald Trump on Friday signed a new act namely 2020 National Defense Authorization Act through which the United States of America has now created a new branch of military known as the space force this space force will be the sixth formal force of the us military after the army air force navy marines and the coast guard now let us understand what exactly is the issue about militarization of space now by militarization of space we mean the placement and the development of weaponry and military technology in the outer space now as early as the mid 20th century both united states and the then soviet union led early exploration of the space as an opportunity to demonstrate their ballistic missile technology and other technologies which then again do have the potential for military application so basically developing and placing weapon and military technology in the outer space is known as the militarization of space and the united states of america and the soviet union have indulged in this before also somewhere around the mid 20th century Next let us understand what are some of the possible ways or the aspects in which the space can be put to military use The first is through a reconnaissance satellite Now reconnaissance is an intelligent satellite which is basically an earth observation satellite or a communication satellite which is deployed for military or intelligence purposes Therefore any earth observation satellite or a communication satellite which is used for military or intel purposes is known as a reconnaissance satellite second is the global positioning system now currently the space militarization uses the gps technology now gps is a satellite navigation system which is used to determine a things exact precise location on the earth and this gps by providing a highly accurate time reference almost anywhere on the earth or in the earth orbit can be used for tracking and navigation The third is military communication systems. Now of late there has been an emerging trend of military doctrine of network centric warfare where the space is being used for military communication systems. Under this military communication system 
Use of high speed communication is very rampant, which allows all the soldiers and branches of military to view the battlefield in real time. Hence, by using the military communication system, the countries are able to view the battlefield in real time, and this provides them an edge in a network centric warfare. To give you an example of military communication system, recently India has launched the GSAT 7 for the Indian Navy. The next use is of space weapons. Now, space weapons are any kind of weapons that can attack space systems in the orbit, which essentially include the anti satellite weapons. So, basically, what these weapons do is that they attack the targets on Earth from the outer space, or they disable missiles traveling through space by using weapons placed on the Earth. Now, the origin of these space weapons started during the Cold War era, wherein the United States and the erstwhile Soviet Union were trying to contest their superpower in the outer space. And even today, some of these space weapons remain under development. Furthermore, the space weapons are also a central theme in a lot of military science fiction and science fi video games. Now, having understood about the militarization of space, let us see whether we have some kind of agreement prohibiting or allowing the militarization of outer space. Now, as far as if we have any agreement to prohibit the militarization of outer space is concerned, the answer is yes, and it is the Outer Space Treaty. Formerly known as the Treaty on Principles Governing the Activities of State in the Exploration and Use of Outer Space, including the Moon and other celestial body, it is this Outer Space Treaty which forms the basis of the international space law. So please remember the name of this treaty. And as of 2019, 109 countries are part to this treaty, while another 23 have signed but not have yet completely ratified it. Let us see what are the provisions under this treaty. Now, the main point, of course, is that it prohibits the placing of nuclear weapons in the outer space. Secondly, it limits the use of moon and other celestial bodies to only peaceful purposes. That is, the countries can explore moon and other celestial bodies, but only for peaceful purposes and not for any military purpose. Thirdly, it establishes that space will be free for exploration and use by all nations, but no nation may claim sovereignty of outer space or any celestial body. Hence, the outer space is free for explanation for all and every nation and no nations can say that certain celestial body or the outer space is their sovereignty or comes under their jurisdiction or area. Now, what is to be noted is that this outer space treaty does not ban military activities within the space. In fact, it even does not ban the weaponization of space. The only exception is that we cannot place any weapons of mass destruction in space. That is, we cannot place any nuclear weapons in space. Now, this outer space treaty is mostly a non-armament treaty and the regulation which it offers are very ambiguous in nature because with time, new kind of space activities have come to the fore such as lunar and asteroid mining. However, the space treaty is ambiguous and insufficient especially if we talk about the new developments which are happening. Now, in the PDF to this article, we have attached other treaties governing the outer space, which includes the various UN resolutions such as PAROS, TCBMs, etc. So, you can get extra information about the outer space treaties from the PDF. With this, let's move on to our next news. Now, this next news has been taken from page number 8 and it is talking about the bar-headed goose which has been recently spotted near Pandalam in Kerala. Now, the reason the spotting is important is because earlier, though a large flock of these birds used to visit, used to visit the Kunthakulam bird sanctuary in Tamil Nadu, however, it is a rare sight that these birds have been spotted in Kerala. Hence, in our discussion today, we will be talking about the bar-headed goose. Now, the bar-headed goose is basically a native bird of Central Asia of central China and Mongolia where they breed. However, they start their migration to Indian subcontinent in the winter season because in the winter season, central China and Mongolia become very cold. Therefore, they stay in the Indian subcontinent till the end of the season. Now, what is special about the bar-headed goose is that they are one of the very few birds which can fly at very high altitudes. Now, this is evident from the fact that they cross the Himalayas to come to India and go back to China and Mongolia. Therefore, their capacity to fly in extremely hypoxia state distinguishes them from similar lowland waterfowl. 
And in India, the bare-headed goose is usually spotted at Tamil Nadu and this time in Kerala as well. Now this article also mentions about the Bird Atlas project. Now this Kerala Bird Atlas project is basically a citizen science project. And the main aim of this project is to map the distribution and abundance of the birds which are found in an entire state. And this is a first of its kind initiative in India because it is for the first time that, in, that the distribution and abundance of the bird is being mapped in the entire state. Further, you should know that this project started in the year 2015 as a five-year activity. Now, the discussion of this article is important from the perspective of prelims because a question can be asked about the bar-headed goose as well as the Kerala Bird Atlas project. So with this, let's move on to our next news. Now this next news appears on page number 3 and it reads, No religion linked party name allowed since 2005. Now the context of the news is that recently a PIL has been filed by BJP leader Ashwani Kumar Upadhyay seeking a review of all those political parties which have names with religious connotations or are using symbols similar to our national flag. And in response to this PIL, the Election Commission of India filed an affidavit. In its response in the affidavit, Election Commission has clearly stated that in 2005, it took a policy decision that it will not register any political party which has a name with religious connotation. However, any party which has been registered before 2005 cannot be later deregistered on the ground that its name has a religious connotation. A few examples of such political party can be the Hindu Sena, Indian Union Muslim League, etc. Secondly, as far as the question of the Indian National Congress using the national flag as its party symbol, this question has already been decided by the Supreme Court in affirmative and the Supreme Court has allowed the Indian National Congress to use such a party symbol because it has been doing so for a long time. Further, the Election Commission also stated, Particulars regarding the flags of the political parties is not a relevant consideration while registering political parties. Hence, this information can be important because it can be asked in the prelim examination. Now, since we have mentioned the Election Commission of India, let us revise from our previous video where we discussed all the basics about the Election Commission. Now, the task of conducting as well as superintending most of the elections in our country is the mandate of the Election Commission. The Election Commission has been thoroughly discussed in the Rao's C3 module of 2018. Let us know a few things about the Election Commission. The Election Commission of India is a permanent as well as an independent body constituted under Article 324 of the Indian Constitution. The main or the basic objective of the Election Commission is to ensure free and fair elections in our country. Under Article 324 of the Indian Constitution, the Election Commission of India has been given the power of superintendence, direction as well as control of the elections to the Parliament, State Legislatures as well as the Office of the President and the Vice President. Thus, the Election Commission of India is an all India body in the sense that it is common to both the central government and the state governments. Please bear in mind that the elections to panchayat as well as the municipalities that is the local bodies in our country is the mandate of the state election commission which has been constituted via the 73rd and the 74th constitutional amendment act of 1992. Now as far as the constitution of the election commission is concerned again article 324 provides that the chief election commissioner as well as the number of election commissioners shall be fixed by the president from time to time. So as per the original constitution, the number of election commissioners were not fixed. But in 1991, the government came out with an act and since then, the composition of the election commission is that it consists of one chief election commissioner as well as two other election commissioners. Moving on, Article 324 also provides that the appointment of the Chief Election Commissioner as well as other commissioners shall be made by the President. You should also remember that the Chairman of the Election Commission is the Chief Election Commissioner. Moving on, as far as the removal of the Chief Election Commissioner is concerned, 
the chief election commissioner cannot be removed from his office except in the same manner and on the same ground like the judge of the supreme court thus in other words the chief election commissioner can only be removed by the president on the basis of a resolution passed by both the houses of the parliament with special majority but please remember that for other election commissioners they can be removed from their office on the basis of recommendations of the chief election commissioner therefore the process of removal of the chief election commissioner as well as the other election commissioner is very different now as far as the tenure of the office of the election commissioners are concerned article 324 originally said that the condition of services as well as the tenure shall be determined by the president but in the year 1991 the government has come out with an act and according to that act now the tenure of the chief election commissioner as well as the other commissioner is fixed to 6 years or until they attain the age of 65 further they can resign at any time or can also be removed before the expiry of their term moving on as far as the jurisdiction of the courts are concerned the constitution of india has specifically said that the validity of any law relating to the delimitation of constituencies or regarding the allotment of seats to such constituencies cannot be questioned in any court of law in other words the courts of india are barred from trying such cases further it is also to be kept in mind that any matter related to the election to the parliament or even to the state legislature is barred from being tried in any court of law during the conduct of that election in other words when the election is being conducted either to the parliament or to the state legislature then during that course of election no petition can be filed or entertained by any court in law but once the election process is over then election petitions can be filed in the high court as provided under the representations of people act 1951 but please bear in mind that any doubts or dispute arising out of the election of the president or the vice president of india shall be inquired into only by the supreme court hence to simply put the petitions in relation to the election of president and the vice president will be entertained in the supreme court whereas the petition related to any other election in the country shall be first filed with the high court though the supreme court of india does enjoy appellate jurisdiction for such cases as well now this next news appears on page number 15 and says that the prime minister has shared the first meet on the investment this article speaks about the cabinet committee on investment and growth which has been discussed thoroughly in the dns stated 7th july 2019 along with other cabinet committees you can refer to this dns for more information on this topic the next news appears on page number 11 titled periyar the hero of vikram Now in this article the author is speaking about E V Ramaswamy who led the Dravidian movement. Now we have spoken about E V Ramaswamy in the DNS dated 17 September 2019. You can refer to this DNS for more information on E V Ramaswamy. So with this let's move on to our practice questions. Now based on our today's discussion here is a prelims practice question. Please pause the video and solve them and we'll discuss the answer after 5 seconds. Question number 1 is with res- is with respect to quick reaction surface to area missile. The first statement it is propelled by liquid fuel this is incorrect it is propelled by solid fuel. Second it is most effective for high flying target this is incorrect it is most effective for low flying aerial targets. Hence the right answer is D. Question number 2 reads which of the following states is the first in India to initiate a bird atlas project? The right answer is A Kerala. Question number 2 is asking us to consider statements with respect to outer space treaty. First, it bans all kind of military activity in the space. This is incorrect. It only bans nuclear activity in space or deploying weapons of mass destruction in space. Second statement, India is a party to the treaty. This is correct. So the right answer becomes B 2 only. 
क्वेश्चन नंबर फोर थ्री विच ऑफ द फॉलोइंग आर मेंबर्स ऑफ द यूरेशियन इकोनॉमिक यूनिट फर्स्ट क्राइगिस्तान दिस इज करेक्ट सेकेंड उजबेकिस्तान इन करेक्ट थर्ड आर्मीनिया इज राइट फोर्थ रशिया इज राइट एंड फिफ्थ बेलारिस इज ऑल्सो राइट हेंस दी राइट आंसर टू दिस क्वेश्चन बिकम्स ए वन थ्री फोर एंड फाइव ओनली विद दिस वी कम टू एन एंड फॉर टू डेज डिस्कशन लेट्स मूव टू द क्वेश्चन फॉर द डे